Uh, thank you for having me, uh, Victoria and, uh, and the team. Um, I'm uh, uh, going to talk to the topic of my uh, conversation today is uh, managing urban expansion from global monitoring to stakes on the ground. Um, I'll just give you kind of a brief uh, introduction of how I got into it. And I come from uh, the study of housing policy and I've been studying it for uh, a long time, uh, working in uh, Asia and then in Latin America. And I noticed that uh, what happened to housing policy was that we, when we started out, we had two prongs of housing policy. You know, what do we do with the existing stocks, the slums, the squatter settlements? How do we upgrade them, give them tenure, provide services? And then what about the new stock? What about all these new people who are going to come? How are we going to house them? So we started out talking about public housing. That didn't get anywhere. We moved to talking about sites and services. Maybe we just give them land and they bring, build their own houses. That also didn't get anywhere. And then people just gave up and forgot about it. So when you ask people these days, let's say at the World Bank, uh, people who are doing with dealing with housing will find it's all great about slum upgrading and infrastructure and so on. But what about the new stock? And then people say, well, I don't know. We forget about it. So I got interested in the new stock. So how do we make uh, room for the new stock? So it turns out that for me, the uh, shift is instead of trying to make housing affordable, we try to make land affordable. Make, as long as land markets are open and affordable, somehow the poor get land and they can house themselves. So then the issue becomes, how do we ensure the land remains affordable on the urban fringe. So in order for land remain, to remain affordable on the urban fringe, we have to just see how much land is needed for expansion and how we can prepare that land and make it accessible so it can get integrated into metropolitan job markets. And so that my emphasis has changed to studying urban expansion. And then when I come to a mayor and I say, well, your city is going to grow up by two, three, four times during the next 30 years. He say, oh, come on, this is a joke. That's not, never going to happen. Uh, he says, oh, yeah, it does happen. And then I start to look at, uh, at global numbers to prove that these things actually happen. So unless you are an exception to the rule, it's what's going to happen to you is what's going to happen to everybody else. And uh, so let's look at the numbers for uh, global urban expansion. So I basically stopped doing what I was doing and started to collect data on global urban expansion. And this is how I got to this field. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, monitoring global expansion and then go back to, to, to talking about mayors and what they're doing on the ground in the cities that we are uh, working with. So uh, we start out by saying, uh, and this uh, appeals to people here who have a kind of a world, uh, world uh, view. Uh, let's look at the universe of cities. So what you see here are all the cities in the world that have 100,000 people or more in 2010. And that uh, uh, number keeps uh, changing. We keep correcting it, refining it. Right now, we found about 4,245 cities that had 100,000 people or more. And when I say cities, I refer to cities and metropolitan areas. So I mean, Chicago is the Chicago metropolitan area, not the city of Chicago, but includes everything uh, around it. So uh, from that, we move uh, to uh, monitoring. So what we're doing is first we're mapping and measuring uh, urban expansion, and then uh, and that was part of the answer to what I was trying to talk to Angelina and Roger when we were, uh, is the mapping and measurement of urban layouts, which done at a different scale than uh, with different uh, satellite imagery, and then uh, uh, took, uh, going to actually answer, answering some questions on the ground in uh, the cities that we're trying to get the information from. So. Uh, we have a partnership with, uh, with the UN uh, Habitat and the Lincoln Institute and the UN Population Division to do all of this work. And much of it is done in preparation for Habitat 3 in parallel to the work that you are doing. So uh, it, in order to work on the uh, 
universe of cities, obviously we need to sample. So we sampled 200 cities out of this universe. This is a very carefully selected sample, much better than the early sample of 120 that we had because we got a lot more statistics professionals involved in creating this sample than before. So it's, uh, it's a stratified sample. It's stratified by regions, uh, by city sizes, there are four city size categories, and by the number of cities in the country. Namely, cities that, uh, countries that have only zero to nine, uh, one to nine cities, 10 to 20, and then 20 or more got sampled in a, a slightly different way. So uh, the first thing that we do is we try to map urban expansion. So we use satellite imagery uh, to do that. It's like uh, Landsat imagery, 30 meter pixel size, uh, to look at impervious surfaces, to define what's built up, not built up, and water. And from that, to construct maps of urban expansion. What you see here is the urban expansion of Accra uh, between uh, 1991, 2000, and 2014. You see that this is massive uh, uh, expansion and uh, not something that any uh, professional just telling you can you know how much do do we expect you say ah well i'd say 50 percent 75 25 but it will not really give you real numbers what we find uh, just to give you an idea is in the 24 years that we've been doing the measurements you know we're doing 1990 2000 2014 that the Built up area of cities that we've measured has gone up uh, by a factor of 2.2. Namely, in the 24 years, it has more than doubled. Right? Now, when you say to people, you know, this is on every global average, you know, when you're considering that in a lot of cities, it's really developing very little. So, the globally, uh, cities have expanded during the last 24 years by 120%. Uh, the expansion of Accra, uh, when you kind of uh, want to go into the, the inside story, is uh, the village chiefs on the periphery of Accra are subdividing and selling land to the middle class, and the middle class is suburbanizing because they can now own cars, they can buy uh, uh, bungalows on the periphery and build housing. So this is a very typical uh, village chief subdivision and uh, uh, and uh, so it's suburbanizing just like New York was suburbanizing uh, at the turn of the century. Uh, and this is a global phenomenon. So when we're talking about urban expansion, it's uh, happening everywhere. And it's happening uh, faster than the growth of population, which I will explain. So uh, we, it, just to check that uh, urban expansion really is more rapid than uh, population growth, we look at 30 cities uh, between 1800 and 2000. We did that, of course, not using air photographs because 1800, they didn't really have satellite imagery. Uh, we used maps of, uh, of uh, the built up areas of cities and the cartographers in the old days did fantastic maps of cities that show their built-up area. This, for example, is the built-up area of Paris from the atlas put together by a, a group in uh, England called the Society for the Diffusion of Useful Knowledge. They put out a great atlas in the uh, it's, uh, SDUK. You can still find those maps on eBay. I collect them. So this is the map of Paris in 1834. So what you see, we, we looked at maps of Paris at 20 year intervals uh, to construct this composite map. What you see, 1800 is the area here during the time of Napoleon. The uh, city of Paris is 11 square kilometers and has a half a million people. In 2000, uh, uh, Paris has got 10 million people and 2000 square kilometers. So the population of Paris during that period grew from half a million to 10 million, it grew 20-fold. The area of Paris grew 200-fold. And 
the difference was that gradual, the, uh, there was a density decline over this entire period of about one, one and a half percent per year. And that was enough for Paris to grow uh, in area much faster than it grew in uh, population. When we look at uh, these 30 cities, this is just uh, in passing, we see that during the 20th century, all of the cities that we studied uh, grew uh, 16 fold. So uh, uh, between, in, uh, on average, between 1925 and 2000, all these 30 cities grow, grew uh, 16 fold. For some cities, let's say uh, 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 Guatemala City, between 1930 and 2000, or Buenos Aires between 1900 and 2000, Santiago, Mexico City, uh, Mexico City between 1930 and 2000 grew up 16 times. So it's not uncommon for cities to grow up 16 fold, right? But when you talk to a mayor and you say, well, let's talk about the next 30 years and we talk about four fold, six fold, it's hard to convince the mayor if you don't have these kind of if you don't have these kind of maps and this kind of data. And uh, the reason that uh, uh, cities are growing uh, faster in, uh, in uh, area than in population is because density, densities are declining. Densities are declining. You know, we don't like densities to increase. Everybody wants to talk about sustainability, saying we need to increase density. Well, that's fine. It's wonderful. but. When we look at densities on the ground, they're declining, and they're declining everywhere. So uh, between uh, 1990 and 2000, uh, densities in developing uh, in, it declined at an average rate of 2.2% for the cities in the global sample. And between 2000 and 2014, they declined at a much slower rate, but still declined at the rate significantly different from zero. And they decline, we need to remember, in all regions. So the old literature said, well, you know, they're declining in the US, but they're not declining in Europe, and they're definitely increasing in developing countries. That's not true. They're declining very rapidly in developing countries, and uh, Europe and Japan are worried about uh, sprawl that they weren't worried about before. And uh, in the land-rich developed countries, the US, Canada, Australia, they're already very low, but still declining, though not significantly. Um, uh, when you look at uh, historically, where the densities have been declining, they've been declining very rapidly. And uh, when you look at 20 cities in the US for which we have data from 1910, you can see that on average, uh, densities have declined five-fold between the beginning of the 20th century and the end of the 20th century. So density decline is a very common, uh, is a very common thing. Uh, of the cities in the global sample that we measured, uh, between uh, 19, uh, 19 and 2000, five out of six cities had density declines. Between, nine, between 2000 and 2014, three out of four cities. So it's still a majority of cities have uh, density decline. Okay, so uh, it, it, when we want to talk about urban expansion, the thing that governs urban expansion, and I was going to put a slide with a model, but I didn't put it in, 50% of the variation in density is accounted for by city size and income. Namely, larger cities are generally denser than smaller ones. And richer cities are generally less dense than poorer ones. And these two explain 60% of the variation in density. So if there are policy issues, they, ex they are at the margin. And we're trying to measure whether policy does affect uh, density. Now, uh, having talked about density and expansion relative to population growth, uh, we're asking ourselves, well, where is uh, urban expansion going to take place in the coming 30 years. And the, when we're talking about planning for expansion, uh, to all the people that we're talking about, we're talking about 30 years. Uh, many of these mayors have 12 years planned, 10 year plan. It's not enough to actually prepare for expansion. You want to prepare for expansion, we have to talk about 30 years. 
Here we're talking about uh, where uh, urban population growth is going to happen between now and 2050. And uh, what we see, and uh, this is uh, not the latest graph. The latest graph is even more radical. Uh, a quarter of the increase in the urban population is going to be in sub-Saharan Africa, another quarter in the Indian subcontinent, about 15% in China, which is growing not so rapidly because of one-child policy, uh, and then the rest, very small numbers in Middle East, North Africa, Southeast Asia, and so on. Uh, uh, in terms of the developed countries, uh, it's interesting. Uh, between now and 2050, the developed countries are going to add 130 million people to their urban populations. The developing countries are going to add 18 times that. So the growth, urbanization is basically finished in the developed countries, except in the United States, with 90 millions out of these 130 millions are going to be in the US. The U.S. is the only developing country when it comes to population growth and urbanization. All the other developed countries are not going to see any urbanization at all. They're going to see shrinking uh, cities. So that's in terms of the global picture of where urbanization is going to take place. Now, where urban expansion is going to take place, now urban expansion, as I said, some of it has nothing to do with population growth. It has to just do with income growth. You know, you have more income, you consume more land, you consume more housing, you consume more of everything. So uh, income growth is going to lead to some urban expansion. So uh, it, let's say in developed countries, uh, uh, from, from a population perspective, you're not going to see any urban expansion. But if income continues to grow, if densities decline by 1% per year, the area of the cities in developed countries will double by 2050. They go up by 2%, it'll triple. But, and, but when you talk about places where there are, where there's very rapid population growth, like Sub-Saharan Africa, if densities remain the same, let's say there's very little income growth, uh, it's going to quadruple, the cities are going to quadruple in size. If there is income growth and density decline, they can go up six times or even 12 times. Yes? Sorry, maybe I missed your point earlier. I thought you said um, the density, poor, poor cities are less dense. No, uh, denser. Yeah, it's a negative. Uh, the poorer the city, the denser it is. Okay. In fact, the elasticity of uh, density with respect to income is about half. Namely, if you double the income, the density declines to half. And the point you know, the other point about size, the smaller the city, the less dense it is. Yes. And the, the elasticity there is about 0.2. So if you double the size, density increased by 20%. Can I ask one more clarification question? Yes. The expansion you're talking about is land use change expansion, not jurisdictional expansion, right? Yes. We're talking about the increase in the built up area of cities and the urbanized open space that is contained within this built up area. Now, um, the second uh, phase of the research that we're doing, and that answers some of your, uh, Angelina, some of the questions that you were asking me, is uh, th this expansion, maybe it's okay. So, so cities expand, wonderful. So why do we have to worry about it? If they expand and we are okay with the expansion, let them expand, right? But the question is, what is the quality of this expansion? And then, so the second phase of our work has to do with looking at high resolution imagery and seeing whether we can say something about the quality of that expansion. So the, uh, what we're looking is, uh, and we can see with high resolution imagery is urban layouts. So if you look at an urban layout, let's say of an, uh, a suburban uh, area in northeast, in northeast Bangkok, what you see is the total absence of arterial roads, for example, which are essential in terms of the connectivity of metropolitan job markets. People have to get to work. Uh, they have to get to work over long distances. So if you don't have an arterial road, 
in Bangkok, in this area, arterial roads are eight kilometers apart. So that uh, if you've been there, and I'm sure some of you have been, this is one of the most congested cities in the world. You just sit in traffic, basically. You're not moving anywhere. So uh, uh, you take another example, a counterexample. This is an invasion in, on the outskirts of Lima. It's a squatter settlement, but it was an organized squatter settlement. They're usually organized by Jesuit priests, and uh, these priests got the students from the engineering department of St. Marcos University in Lima to go and survey the land before they invade it. So it public land, they, so they divided it into blocks uh, with plots of 10 meters by 20 meters. Then people came in during, at, at night. They built a shack in the middle, a bamboo shack in the middle of that plot. Then they start to dig a trench about half a meter wide around the entire plot. This is my plot. And then gradually they built walls around that, uh, uh, around that plot and rooms inside. So this became very quickly a kind of a integrated into uh, Lima's suburbs. These are all very nice houses uh, that are selling between 30 and 40 thousand uh, dollars a, a piece. They've been granted tenure during the uh, Fujimori time, there were big land tenure granting programs, and this is totally integrated into the city. These uh, uh, surveyors left 10 meters of road uh, between, uh, between blocks, so it is uh, plenty of room for movement, plenty of room for parking, and 25% of the land is allocated uh, to streets here. So the way that we measure these urban layouts, we can no longer look at the entire metropolitan area, we look at locales which are 10 hectare locales distributed at random. Here they are only in the expansion area. Later we are also doing the middle of the city. And in each locale, we, uh, we look at uh, uh, the share of the land in streets. So uh, we look at how the share of streets that are less than four meters wide. Uh, we look at uh, different stages of the evolution of residential uh, subdivisions, whether it's atomistic or informal layouts, formal layouts, or projects, and uh, we uh, look at block size, we look at intersection density, some other ways that, uh, that tell us something about these layouts from high resolution satellite imagery. Uh, this turns out, because we have 40 of those uh, on the expansion area and then 40 inside, this is a very, very heavy uh, labor intensive work because it has to be digitized and it takes time. So we've actually uh, uh, opened an urban expansion observatory in uh, Navi, Mumbai in India. And we have, because of Habitat 3, we now have 30 people working there trying to do all the digitizing and calculations before before the deadline, which is like in three months' time, where we have to, to finish that. Now, in, uh, so here are some of the results, which are actually quite astonishing. Uh, you look at Calcutta, the urban fringe of Calcutta, the, the area that was built during the last 24 years. Now, Calcutta, one of the largest cities in the world, uh, with many planning organizations and development corporations and all of that, right? 92% of the land in the expansion area is found to be in atomistic housing, namely completely unplanned housing. Just rural people dividing their land and selling, uh, selling uh, plots to people who then uh, go and bid it. 92%. There are virtually no streets. I mean the 8.4% of the land is devoted to streets, where the normal expectation is about uh, the global average for the entire expansion area is 20%. And the kind of normal subdivision, like the one I showed before for uh, Lima, is 25%. So these people are at uh, a third of that. And two thirds of the roads are less than four meter wide. So you're beginning to see 
uh, with this uh, uh, method uh, something that we can say something about the quality of this expansion. It's not good. It's going to be very, the, the arterial roads are spaced many kilometers apart. To get to work, these places are going to be very difficult to integrate into the Calcutta metropolitan labor market. It's very hard. They're actually creating a disaster. And they're way behind the, uh, in terms of prov provision of infrastru urban infrastructure compared, let's say, to the Chinese, who are doing something strange too. I mean, they're building a lot of uh, ring roads, but at least they're doing a lot of infrastructure. And these people are doing no infrastructure at all. And it's going to be very difficult to think of these cities as integrated uh, metropolitan labor markets compared uh, that functioning in a productive way that they should be functioning. Uh, the third phase of monitoring uh, is uh, actually surveys on the ground in these 200 cities. So we have city-based researchers in each one of these 200 cities, very difficult to do. Uh, some, uh, in order to do that, uh, we were looking only at two issues for now. But we can do more, like we, I was trying to say, we can do water and sanitation, we can do, it. now these studies, one of them is an affordability survey uh, to look at the affordability of land and housing on the periphery of uh, the global sample of cities. The other one is to look at the uh, regulations governing, governing land and housing and how they are affecting uh, the development of these areas. Uh, because the global sample is indeed global, we've had to uh, translate these questionnaires into 10 languages and, uh, and uh, find people that can, uh, that can do the it, it kind of uh, competent people to do them in every, uh, in every city. Uh, this is the affordability questionnaire. This happens to be Korean. This is the uh, regulatory questionnaire. This happens to be Arabic. So, it, and we already have results for more than half the cities. And again, like I said, it has to be ready for Habitat 3, so it's moving, it's moving very rapidly. And you can see, let's say, how many cities have green belts, uh, how many uh, 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 cities have uh, regulations governing, governing minimum lot size, uh, building height, any restrictions on development. So. Uh, you can already begin to see results. Now I'm saying this is the first time we're doing that, so it's not a perfect uh, way of doing it, but what we're doing is creating a platform so that you can study the global sample of cities along many dimensions again and again. We've already got uh, one of my colleagues who is an air quality person to measure uh, particulate matter in these 200 cities so that we have the data for particulate matter on all of the cities in the sample. So it's just a matter of gradually accumulating uh, data for monitoring this global sample over time. And what we're trying to do is do it on the cheap so that you can repeat it. You know, if, if you took, uh, if each one of those studies called mil millions of dollars, we could not repeat it. So the idea is that we can do a study like that at, at, in 200 cities for three hundred thousand dollars, right? So that you can actually repeat it or do other similar ones again and again. Right? So if not three hundred, four hundred. So uh, I move to the next uh, uh, second part of my talk, which is the reason that we're doing all this monitoring uh, is not because we're kind of a research organization, but because we're trying to influence mayors. We're trying to influence mayors to say there's going to be a lot of expansion. You better make some minimal preparations for it instead of letting it go, which we, then you get situations like Calcutta. You don't want that. You want orderly urban expansion. You want the expansion to be productive, inclusive, and sustainable. So how do you do that? So we have devised a really simple program 
for doing that that basically has only four steps and that can be uh, easily understood and implemented on the ground by municipal teams. So we're not even doing the planning or uh, we're just kind of hand-holding, capacity building, uh, um, educating these people how to prepare for their expansion. So the four steps are the first to make realistic projections of the land needs over the next 30 years. Thank you. Second, to expand city limits so that uh, you can plan within this area because if it's beyond your limits, you're not going to be able to do anything. And third, to prepare an arterial road grid, which uh, what we're saying is uh, there are many things to plan for, but you have to have some priorities in what you have to decide now. So we're saying the most important thing for you to decide now is to create an arterial grid one kilometer apart of 30 meter roads in the entire expansion area and acquire the right of way for these roads now so that you know that you have some control over the development process. And the fourth thing that we're saying is protect public open spaces and that is like uh, try to uh, protect areas of high environmental risk from development and also try to make sure that there's enough public open spaces in the expansion area so it doesn't all get built up. Um, now, the idea of creating plans for a six or seven fold expansion of the city uh, sounds uh, unrealistic, but it has been done before. There are two historical examples which uh, are important to no, one is the famous Ensanche plan for Barcelona, uh, created by Ildefonso Cerda in uh, 1859. And uh, this was a competition that he won, and he stayed for 20 years to actually implement it on the ground. So when you go to Barcelona, you can actually see this. These are kind of uh, large blocks, and the area uh, of expansion that was planned was about nine times the, uh, the built up area of the city at the time. The other example, an even earlier one, is the uh, commissioner's plan for Manhattan, uh, which you see here. Uh, this was uh, approved in 1811. Uh, the population of uh, Manhattan at the time was about 90,000 people. And uh, it created an area for about a seven-fold expansion of the city. Uh, in a kind of an ordered way that we uh, uh, recognize, of course, uh, today. The interesting uh, story about, and this was done by Governor uh, Morris and a couple of other uh, uh, commissioners. He's one of the founding fathers. He's signed on the uh, uh, Constitution. Uh, the interesting story about New York is that it took about, until uh, about the end of the century, for uh, Manhattan to fill up with, uh, with building. And then at 1897, when Manhattan was running out of land, uh, Manhattan, New York City, uh, acquired uh, the, the four surrounding counties and uh, added the Bronx, Queens, Brooklyn, and Richmond County, later renamed Staten Island, to its land again increasing its area sevenfold. Now the interesting thing about New York again, uh, with the tradition of, the, uh, of building the grids, in 1900, Louis Rees, chief engineer of the topographical department, produced a plan for the entire five borough of gridded, uh, of, uh, gridded blocks and open spaces. Here you can see the proposed parks. And this is Queens at the time. Of course, there was nothing there. And that area, again, a seven-fold expansion area, was then filled in 35 years, right? So this kind of growth has happened before and is happening now as we speak. So the idea of getting people to think in terms of three times, four times, five times is not unrealistic once you get the numbers uh, right. 
So here's uh, one of our efforts. We're working now in a number of countries. The two countries where our work is most advanced are Ethiopia and Colombia. In Ethiopia, we started out with four cities. Uh, Bahir Dar was shown here, Hawassa, uh, uh, Adama, and uh, Mekele, uh, four regional capitals in Ethiopia. And we started out by, uh, by looking at their built-up areas and then trying to project these built-up areas to give them an idea of how much the city is going to grow if we make some assumptions about population growth and density. And uh, we uh, uh, got the mayor and the municipal teams to come to a workshop in Addis a couple of years ago. And we uh, started to uh, uh, instruct them about how to uh, create their arterial grid plans and the uh, open space uh, preservation plans. Here you see the, the Bahir Dar team in, in the workshop in, uh, in Addis. Now, the, the interesting thing uh, in uh, uh, Ethiopia in general is the Minister for uh, Urban Development and Construction finds this thing very appealing. Urbanization is one of the key goals in the, uh, for the uh, government. Uh, he has instructed uh, these uh, cities to provide him with plans and budgets. Uh, they all have plans and budgets and are all working towards the implementation of this program uh, in terms of uh, opening up the areas with arterial roads and protecting open spaces. And this is pro uh, progressing very quickly. And in the meantime, 14 other cities have been added. And uh, urban expansion is being taught as a course in the Ethiopian Civil Service University to hundreds of officials and basically the entire country has learned how to do urban expansion. And this is, uh, for example, the, the plan for Mekele, uh, urban expansion. Uh, the uh, people are now in the process of uh, acquiring the rights of way for the arterial grid. So there are teams of surveyors that are going on the urban periphery. Here you see one team. Uh, laying out the road in the expansion area of Hawassa. So what they're doing is they are saying, you know, the road's going to come up to here. You see the arrow here? The road's going to come up to here. You have to move your house to the edge. And if you move your house, we'll give you a 99-year lease on the land. So this is happening very rapidly. In Hawassa, which is leading the way, they already have more than 60 kilometers of land uh, laid out and they are starting to uh, pave some of the roads. So here you can see the clearing and the paving. Uh, this is in Mekele, uh, an arterial road being gridded. Now, the other country that we're working in is Colombia. And uh, there are two cities in Colombia which are moving ahead. One of them is Monteria. The other one is uh, Valle du Par. So again, what you see here is the arterial grid for, uh, for Monteria. And in Monteria, the method for getting the grid is a little bit different. It's just a matter of registering liens on the property titles of, uh, of the uh, landowners on the urban periphery saying there's a, there's a road that's going to pass here. Now, the new mayors, in the meantime, we thought we'd finish it during the time of the old mayors. We didn't. So now there are new, the two new mayors are on board with this plan. And we decided that for symbolic purposes, even though the lands are not needed now, that we want to plant trees along both along the sidewalks of these roads. So now the, uh, the budgets have been secured for uh, two large nurseries in both of these cities. And the kids from the school are going to come and plant trees at 10 meter intervals along the entire uh, rights of way over the arterial roads in the expansion area of these cities. Uh, another city that we're working with is Reynosa in uh, Mexico. Uh, sorry for the typographical error here. There, this is a, a city that is growing extremely rapidly on the border. And uh, they are moving ahead again with their arterial road grid and are uh, in the business of uh, securing the land. Another city that the fastest growing city in Latin America 
Playa del Carmen in Mexico is another one. Where, uh, this is a tourism city on the coast south of Cancun uh, that has made plans for its expansion and is now again in the bu business of uh, securing the lands for this expansion. So uh, we, are work we have other uh, initiatives to work with countries. We have started uh, a project in Myanmar. We have another project in China, another project in uh, uh, Indonesia, where we're working with Jim uh, Spencer, and another uh, project in Mexico. And uh, we also have a World Bank uh, project in Rwanda. So in Rwanda, it was interesting because the people in Rwanda uh, looked at what the Ethiopians are doing and said, we basically want the same thing. Can you help with Rwanda? So we have a World Bank project in Rwanda, and where we have all kinds of uh, uh, engagements with other uh, countries. What we'd like to do is kind of start pilot projects with four or five cities in the country. Usually, two of, two of them kind of move ahead. The rest of them are behind. And then this thing naturally grows to a, natu to a national uh, program. So uh, this is basically the summary of what we do. Uh, thank you.